Please be seated. Our reading for today comes from Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats. Every breath he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest, and he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the rest of many followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions <coughs> led him by the hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, vision calling him, Ananias, uh, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas, and when you get there, ask for a man named from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now, and I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But, 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 but Lord, explained Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appear to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up, and he was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food, and he regained his strength. <coughs> word of God, Word of life. Thanks be to God. Today we continue our series in uh, the book of Acts, uh, Empowered for Jesus' Mission. Each uh, week throughout the summer, we have been reading these stories of the early church, learning how we can be empowered to do the same things that they were doing, building and continuing upon the mission of Jesus. This week, we come across the story of Saul. Now, there's a quick video I want to show us that uh, uh, will help us, I think, capture a little bit of who Saul is. People call me Saul once, a Hebrew of Hebrews, followers of but I watched the rebellion grow like a fire and spread. Claims of a Messiah and the resurrection, the Son of God they declared, and for that, I looked at them. My will was bent on destruction, but on the road to ruin, my world was torn apart. A voice called my name in the scales, was now consuming and refining me. People called me Saul once, but that was another life, for I am a new creation. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And neither death nor life, not even the powers of hell, will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Today's story is about how a man named Saul encounters Jesus. Now, a few things about who Saul is. Saul is the same person that we call the Apostle Paul. He has two names. One is his Hebrew name, one is his Greek name. So sometimes it's confusing because there's two names, and we don't always equate the two people, but they're one and the same. Saul was a person who was a Pharisee, uh, a professional religious person. He's not a priest. He's just one of those professionally religious, orthodox, conservative type of people. 
Uh, and that's his living, he's just being religious, that's how he makes his living. He, he gets money from his parents, so he's from an upper class family. Uh, and he is on the fast track for success and for advancement within religious circles. He's devoted to God, and he's zealous, and he is one of the chief people who is persecuting the followers of Jesus. He was there to arrange the killing of Stephen, one of the early leaders of the church. He also has not only been resulting in killed people, he's stolen homes and had them arrested, men and women put in chains. His hatred is so deep towards the people who follow Jesus that he goes to get whatever permissions he can to be able to travel to another country to arrest those people, to bring them back in chains, to face uh, imprisonment or death in his own country. Now the equivalent of this would be if someone from ISIS came from the Middle East, came to America and started rounding up Muslim believers who didn't act in the way that they did and dragged them, even if they were Americans, all the way back to, to uh, uh, the Middle East, some remote place or de in the desert, to arrest them or to kill them. That's the kind of person Paul slash Saul was. And so he's on this trip to Damascus. He's going to, to cause havoc. And maybe you have met someone like him. Uh, just recently I was talking to a woman about she had to quit her job. And the reason she told me she quit her job was that the work environment was incredibly toxic. And she shared some horrifying stories. And maybe you can relate because you know how people who are filled with anger or bitterness or jealousy like Saul was. You know how toxic they can be. You know how they can kind of poison the atmosphere around them. And it's hard just to be in their presence because either you kind of absorb their toxic toxicity, is that a word? Uh, either you absorb it and become like them, or you kind of have to flee. It is so overpowering, the hatred and the jealousy and the resentment and the bitterness that is in their heart. Maybe you've met people like that. That's who Saul was. And so he's on the road to Damascus and he encounters Jesus. Now a couple things about this encounter that stand out to me that I think are relevant to us. The first thing is this. As Saul encounters Jesus, he is incredibly humbled. He is forced to his knees and his sight is taken away from him. You'll notice that as the encounter ends and he goes to Damascus, he's got to be led by the hand by his servants in order to get there. Because he can no longer see. This has got to be incredibly humiliating for someone who's filled with pride and can, you know, quote his own accomplishment. It's a long list of things that he has done to prove what kind of person he is. And what we learn from this is that God will go to any extent in order to gain a hold of someone's hearts, including ours. And for some of us, that's a scary thought because we think of God as this majestic being who's going to make my life peaceful and quiet. And that's not what happens to Saul. Saul's life is turned upside down. I hate to use this word, he's broken, because that it brings up this image of a horrible God. But God is not afraid to strip things out of our lives in order so that the things that hold us captive, the chains that hold us away and catch our hearts, are removed. And oftentimes, that can be a painful experience. It was not an easy experience for Saul. But why is God doing this? So that God can capture Saul's heart. That is such an important part of the story. Our gospel for today is one of the most difficult ones. Because Jesus openly says, I'm not always going to bring peace into your life. In fact, God's presence when it comes into your life is going to be an antithesis. It's going to be uh, like oil and water. It's, it's not going to mix with the ways of this world. And God's very presence is going to bring turmoil at times into your life. That's what happens with Saul. And that's a truth that is a scary truth. But it's an okay truth because we trust in God's touch. We trust that God knows what God is doing and that God is leading us towards a better future even though the past sometimes can be painful. That is what happened to Saul. Saul's life is turned upside down. Saul is stripped of his arrogance. He's stripped of his own belief in himself. His own, his own desire to do everything he can and to exert his own power. All of that is taken away from him. And God does that so that Paul's heart 
to be given to God. You'll notice as Paul is going on this road, it's a very short encounter. For someone who's the enemy of God, who's the enemy of the church and the, and the enemy of Jesus, what actually literally happens is he comes, he meets Jesus in this powerful vision, he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he's like, huh, who, who is it? I, it's Jesus. It's, I'm going to be persecuting. Now get up and go. That's it. There's no long theological treatise. There's no big zapping of lightning. I mean, I guess the blinding is big enough, right? But there is, it's not a long dialogue or a long discussion. All he does is have to come face to face with Jesus and everything changes. Now, this is what I think that we have to grab onto and hold onto and realize that in our lives there are people that on the surface appear like they are the enemies of God, that they are our enemies. There are people who we cannot stand, we get under our skin, we make our lives miserable. Those people who seem far away from God, those are people that might be like Saul. And what they need is to encounter Jesus. Because if they could just encounter Jesus and God's grace, it melts away all the other things that are holding their hearts captive. As Paul arrives, slash Saul, Saul arrives in uh, Damascus, there is a man, Ananias, he's a believer, a follower of Jesus, a member of the community of God, a member of the church. And he is praying, and he gets a vision from God that he's supposed to go to Saul and heal him. And not only heal him, share with him the most precious gift that he has, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, Ananias, as you and I would be, he's immediately very uh, wary. He's like, um, God, are you sure? Because I've heard about this guy, and I know what he's going to do. These are crazy instructions, and they are. You just don't do that. Think about the person who has power over you to imprison you and drag you back in chains. You're going to go and give him the most precious thing that you have, a healing and the gift of the Holy Spirit? That's ludicrous. And this is what God asks Ananias to do. And Ananias is okay. He, he voices his, uh, his question because he, he, any person in their right mind would question his instructions. But even though he questions and doesn't understand, he goes anyway. And one of the reasons he goes is that God says, this man, Saul, is my chosen instrument. And we can never, one of the most important things about this is that we can never decide who God is going to use, who God's capable of using. Because God's chosen instruments are not based on our views, our values, the way we think things ought to go. And this ought to be reassuring, because that means I need to be God's chosen instrument as well, because by any worldly standards, I am not qualified to be an instrument of God. And neither are you, but that's okay. Because in this story, we learn that even Saul, even the enemies of God, can become instruments of God. So you and I are in good company. We don't have to think of ourselves as, I've got nothing to offer God, I've got nothing to offer the church, I've got nothing that I can do to help grow God's kingdom to complete Jesus' mission. I can't do that. Who am I? Well, you're no worse than Saul. That's for sure. Anybody killed and imprisoned anybody lately? Anyone? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, for reassuring me about that. That means you are capable of being an instrument of God. God can use you. That's part of the grandness of this story. But no one is too far away from God. All of us can be used as God's chosen instrument. One more thing, and it's an important truth, and it's the way that Ananias and the church community respond to Paul. Ananias, despite his fear, which is a justified fear, gets up and goes and does what God tells him to do. Because Ananias, and the, the, the rest of the story, if you continue reading in chapter 9, uh, Paul immediately goes and starts preaching about Jesus. I mean, on, on that moment, he goes to the synagogue, he starts preaching about Jesus, he's telling everybody about who Jesus is. And because of that, all the religious leaders in that city in Jerusalem, they want to kill Saul. And so what does the church community do? They save and rescue that. Hide him, they feed him, and when that pressure gets too much, they lower him out in a basket out the window of the city wall, and so Paul can escape. They immediately embrace Saul slash Paul. And they do this because they see someone who needed to meet Jesus. They don't see their enemy, they don't see the person who forced them to flee their homes, they don't see the person that's killing 
followers of Jesus, they don't see someone who steals people's stuff in their homes and evicts them and carries them away in chains. All they see when they see people like Saul, hey, that's someone who needs to be Jesus. And the people like Saul that we encounter throughout the day, including ourselves, guess what? They and you and me, all we are are people that need to be Jesus. And so part of the challenge of this passage is that we begin to see people as this first church saw people. All the people that we think that they are far away from God, they have no hope of uh, discovering and experiencing the love of God, of devoting their lives and being captured by God. All they need is an encounter with Jesus. And we have been equipped to provide those encounters. Think about that. When someone is getting on your nerves this way, when someone is frustrating you or making your life miserable, don't think of them as the antagonist, as the enemy. Think of them as someone who needs to encounter Jesus. And then pray, God, how can I help this person to make me help? Because it's not your holy life that's going to change them. It's not your words even. It's how they encounter Jesus through your life, through your words, through your actions. That's going to change them. Amen? Amen. Takeaways for today. God will do what is necessary to gain a hold of someone's heart. And that includes turning someone's life upside down. Second one. God's chosen instruments are not based on our views or our values. It's important that we realize that, especially because we also become God's chosen instruments simply because God has already captured our hearts. That's all that's required. And the last one, Jesus' followers see Saul as someone who needed to encounter Jesus. Not as the enemy, not as the aggressor, not as someone whose heart is cold and turned away from God. They see someone who needs to encounter Jesus, and that is what guides and forms their attitude and how they respond to him. Let's stand for our song today. Thank you.